Hi there. Well, it's part two of my tribute for my grandmother, and um, whereas earlier, during part one, it was raining, and I was glancing at the squirrel outside, now it's twilight, almost night, and there are fireflies outside, and um, it's gorgeous. The fireflies are gorgeous, so um, I think probably it's a good time to read the more philosophical, poetic poem. Um, oh, I'm sorry, philosophical poetic prose piece um, that I wrote actually for my uh, grand uncle of mine, a very dear grand uncle of mine who died in 2004. And you know, he died in December. He died about two weeks before the South Asian tsunami in which a quarter of a million people died. So um, that's what prompted this piece. It was a part a tribute to him, but then to, you know, my grief was for one man, and then, you know, two weeks later, a quarter of a million people die, and um, so this piece is for all everyone who passed away in those two weeks in December, but it's also for my grandma, um, and it's, well, it's for everyone. <laughs> it's called Heaven. So, well, let me just start. Heaven, the angel's wings, singed with the absurdity of the shock of sudden absence, shimmer dimly in starlit stillness. Quietly, the angel weeps. You shiver slightly. After all, it is new for you, the strangeness of angels. You have not long been dead. You first soared into the nearness of an empyrean within the murmur of glimmering wings, assuming you were within the realm of the angels. But you soon realized you were flying amongst the souls of soaring birds, those creatures blessed with the good fortune to sweep past gods asleep, even in the graceful lift of their earthly life. You follow the sylvan avian spirits into a garden of dreaming gods, steeped within such distilled stillness, you wondered if heaven were no more than the essence of incandescent quiescence. The gods never stopped dreaming. You hesitated there, wanting to watch worlds willed into being, willed into being, to witness for yourself the wonder of starlit stillbirth. But you were swept away by the stream of souls of soaring birds. You flew higher and higher until suddenly you understood that you had soared far beyond the sylvan avian spirits, but still a fluff of wings, a flutter of beings, their touch, however, of infinite finesse, exquisitely celestial, generously gentle, and you felt a tear that disappeared upon appearing, for you understood you were now amongst angels. Your own newly released soul began to sing and flooded into, t flooded with tears that disappeared upon appearing. You followed them higher and higher into the realm of the genuinely gentle. You saw they came here to rest. These angels never angry came here to rest upon wished for swings made of dancing strings whose translucent tendrils reached into the dark pyre of the deep loosened death of sky. And you realized, with the catch of breath now dead, that the gods were no more than starry sky dreamers, dreaming their unguarded dreams. And it was in this garden of sacred creation that created secrets came to nest, these sage, gentle angels, seeking a space of rest from the great death upon the earth. They swung gracefully here, in the galaxial grace of God-filled space. And you felt you had come home. Your tears disappeared upon appearing, for you had come home, here where kiss spirits, those who were so dearly missed upon the earth, resided, within the lit-up sight of night angels, those angels who are ignited into being only within the fragility of the weakest of human frailties. You were home, away from fated plots that plotted upon the earth, from their neatly ironed irony and dim-witted wit. Suddenly, the angels left, in a swish of a heart wish, except for one. This angel watches you, all the while, gently weeping. Suddenly, you are jostled, side to side, front to back. A generation, uh, sorry, a generation of generous energy, 
a gestation of sudden sad sadness. You are nearly swept away by a stream of oncoming souls. Their swift motion swishes a silvery crescent into the sacred vacancy of the evanescent. It is why the angels left, once more called down to the earth to hurtle through the space of such earthly hurt. Only one angel remains here, for you. You watch the sage angel never angry, weep, above the garden of dreaming gods within the aching vacancy of the evanescent. You don't know what has happened, but you know many have died at once. It is curious. Up until this moment, your heaven has been your own. It is strange, this dearness of Empyrean, as if your death in the short space of your life has always caressed you constantly with the constance of its kiss. For although you have not long been dead, you understand that death fits. It fits just, despite how deeply you are missed upon the solidness of the stolid earth. It is form-fitting, a puzzle piece of being without, without which you never quite fit into the elegance of inexhaustible existence. Suddenly, such iniquit <laughs> sorry, suddenly, such iniquitous propinquity frightens you to anger. How dear it has been death that has measured the tread of your days. But you know your rage is absurd as the angels themselves, so well versed with the great depth of great death upon the earth, are never angry. But you wish to wake a god nevertheless. You wish to wake a god whose dimly lit dreams are stale with ill birth, to tell him that you damn death with your breath newly dead. You know your home, yet how dare it is death that has lived your life, when your life has all been a dreaming lie. You reach for a god deep down in the depth of unguarded sleep, but the angel genuinely gently stops you, this aged, ageless angel who has never lifted its eyes from you. A kiss of a caress. Before you reach God, you must undream your garden of dreaming gods. You don't understand. You are frightened. You do not know how to disown every deity you have ever known. You start to weep and try to whisper. To forge forgetfulness, it is difficult. Another brush of an angel's wing. You gasp. You are so alone. You do not hover within the dreams of a garden of dreaming gods. They are in your own. To leave the gods for God terrifies you, but the angel takes you gently, and within the sanctity of aching, wake, aching vacancy you weep. The angel waits in lit-up stillness. Its grief has passed. It watches you. Suddenly, another silvery crescent of sodden souls. You are jostled once more. You are never alone. You dry your tears that have disappeared upon appearing. Take the angel's hand. You don't know it, but night angels sigh in the space of your small act of grace. You both leap as you leave your dreaming gods. For God. So that's that piece, obviously based on the loss of one man, followed by the loss of a quarter million others. And it's abstract, but it deals with one of my greatest interests, which is um, you know, the idea of religious imagery with, with what we have learned from the universe of quantum mechanics. It's, um, it's like I can't get enough of it. It's so interesting. So lastly, I'll just end with... Um, something very iconic of the Indian American experience. When we would go on road trips on the East Coast and see the White House and, um, you know, Boston Harbor. I remember going on this road trip with my parents and my grandma and grandparents. And my grandma taught me um, the sacred shloka, the supravatam in the car, um, which I never forgot because she taught it to me when I was 10. So. I'll end with Kausalya Supraja Rama Purva Sandhya Pravartate Uttishta Narashar Dula Kartavyam Deva Manikam. That's just the first line. But all Hindus know that one. It's one of the most sacred verses sung in the temple of Tirupati, the holiest Hindu shrine in India. So that's it for my grandma for now. I'm sure there'll be more later. <laughs> Good night.